Okay, welcome to lesson number five in 223, Advanced Ethics. In this particular video, we're going to dive into three more principles. And the third one is going to get explored in even more detail in video number six. The first one I want to look at is called competency and currency. They're really two things, but they go very, very closely together. Competency is just meant to say that we are skilled in a particular area, but it means a little bit more here. Some of the things that we will be asked to do in our workplaces require qualification or a signing off or a demonstration that we're qualified. For example, we might need a delegation of task or a license or a certificate. And in other cases, employers might have stipulations. For example, they might want you to demonstrate that you have a particular amount of experience in place. Anyway, you slice it. The principle basically says that before you accept work that takes a particular level of skill or qualification, you have to make sure that you have it. And that if you don't have it, you must either get it or not take on the work. If I know that I'm not qualified to work on the brakes on somebody's car and they say to me, oh, it's okay, I still want you to do it, I'm, supposed, I'm still supposed to say no because I know that I will not do it well enough. Another part of this is currency, meaning that not only do I have that qualification, but that I've kept it up to date. If it's something like a driver's license or a nonviolent crisis intervention certificate, I'm required to make sure that it's current in the sense that it's still not expired or that it's been refreshed before it expired. But in the case of some things, it's about maintaining a level of experience. For example, imagine that you were told you're going to have a baby. You went to a doctor and the doctor told you they were trained as an obstetrician. But then later on you found that that doctor had not helped the woman with her baby in the last 10 years. Even though that person was qualified at one point, chances are you wouldn't feel comfortable because they hadn't maintained currency. So it's really important for us to have the qualification and also to maintain a currency in it, whether that's an up-to-date certificate or a reasonable amount of practice or frequency in using a skill so that it remains fresh for us, so that we're still skilled in our job. And another example of this might be a group home that has individuals who have supportive, uh, supportive needs around epilepsy, but they may not have seizures very often, so staff people let it kind of slide and they don't practice the protocols. One day somebody has a seizure and staff haven't used the protocol in so long that nobody knows what to do. They violated this principle. Even though that staff person knows that the individual may not have a seizure for many months at a time, they're supposed to practice and be ready, just like fire drills, for example. This principle also says that we should know when we are over our head and get expert help from other people, people from other disciplines, and not try to pretend that we know what to do. So we should not only refuse the work, but go and get people who have competency. It's not okay for us to simply say, well, I don't know what to do, so I'm not going to do anything. It is up to us to go and start digging for answers, finding people who do know. All right, so that's the concepts of competency and currency. The next one is honor and accountability. Accountability, for many people I hear when I ask about this, they think it's the same as responsibility, but it's not. Part of accountability includes accepting responsibility for something, but a far bigger part of it is the notion of being open. So even if a person makes a mistake, they can still be highly accountable as long as they're open and honest about it. They don't just wait till somebody else comes and asks them, did they do something wrong? They actually tell people, they make a report about it and the report is accurate all the way along. Every time somebody is doing accounting, they're being accountable, whether they're taking note of money that was withdrawn from a bank or something that was purchased or money going into a bank account. They're gonna keep an accounting and that's what that word comes from. Same thing with an incident report or a daily log. Or if somebody asks you a question, a superior, and you answer it truthfully, you are being accountable. This is one where I've seen some people over the last few years start to get confused because their collective agreement might say something like, you don't have to participate in an investigation. But that actually is not true from an ethical standpoint. If you do something wrong and you're asked about it, this principle says 
you're supposed to tell people. You're supposed to be honest and offer that information freely. So you should keep accounts of your work and be open to any inquiries. You should always tell the truth when you're asked questions or even when you're just recording things. From the moment you hand in your first resume, it needs to be telling the truth. And you have to behave in a way that will not harm the reputation of yourself or others. So it's not just if you're falsifying documents for yourself. Let's say you're signing a report for a, a colleague. The colleague's worried they'll get fired if they have one more report. So you falsify it to protect that person or to protect your employer. You're still being in violation and of this principle. You're not acting with honor and you're not acting accountably. Finally, in this segment, we're going to talk about privacy and confidentiality. Now, confidentiality is privacy. It's informational privacy. And that's one of the three types of privacy we're going to look at. So when we consider this concept, we're talking about the idea of protecting the client or supported person, the agency, your coworkers, all of them, um, so that their privacy is maintained. That means providing protections around information, as well as protection of people's belongings, including their spaces. So for example, the artifacts that they care about, like their electronics or their toiletries, but also their spaces, like for example, their bedrooms or the drawers in their bedrooms. Those are also places that have a, uh, a stake of privacy in them. And we also have to respect and protect people's body privacy. We'll dive into each of those three types of privacy more in the next video. But before we move on to that video, see if you can take a look at a couple of scenarios and see how the principles we've talked about fit. So ask yourself in these three scenarios these questions. Larry, a coworker, has had 17 different refreshers for his first day training. Let's pretend Larry has worked in the field for many, many years. But his current certificate is two and a half months past the expiry date. Is, it should say, is Larry violating the principles of safety? Is he violating the principles of currency or others? The pause after all three in this case, and we'll give you some answers after that. Here's a second one. Marcia, another coworker, purchased a can of Coke from a pop machine for a supported person named Daniel because it was really hot out and she was worried he was going to overheat. Unfortunately, because it was a pop machine, she couldn't get a receipt. So instead, she signed an explanatory note explaining why there was no receipt, and she wrote the total for that expense on the paper. She had the accurate number. Has she violated the principle of accountability because she didn't provide a receipt? And finally, Alex, one of your coworkers, works in two different organizations. Sometimes he brings the training materials that were created by Agency A to do training of his coworkers in Business B. Is he violating the principles? And is there anything that could change your opinion on this? Anything he could do that would change his behavior to make it better or worse? Pause and see if you can answer all three of these and then take a look at the next slide by starting the video again. All right, let's take a look at Larry. Now, there's not enough evidence to suggest that Larry behaved in any way that's unsafe. In fact, Instinctively, or as a guess, we might conclude that somebody who's had 17 different trainings in first aid is probably going to be pretty versed in first aid. But he is still not current because his employer and the law require him to have a current certificate. So I would not describe Larry as somebody who's been unsafe. We just don't have enough information in the case to suggest that. But he's not current. And by the way, there are circumstances where a person could be current and could be unsafe. There are two separate things. There might be a relationship between them, but they're not automatically going to cause the other. And one more note about Larry. If he didn't tell anybody that his certificate expired, he also violated the principle of accountability. He's supposed to be open about that. He knows, especially after working in the field for as long as he has, that people are supposed to maintain the certificate. And if he's showing up on a shift all of the time with an expired first date certificate, he's behaving unaccountably. Marsha, on the other hand, is doing things right. Now, she took a bit of a chance by going and buying a pop, but she did demonstrate accountability. And if her supervisor thought this was not a good idea, 
the supervisor knew exactly who to go and speak to because Marcia wrote it down and signed it. So if she'd gone and bought a Corvette, she probably would have been in some trouble. But what she would have been in trouble for was not a lack of accountability. She was open about what she did. And it turned out in this case, she was also quite responsible with the money. But the most important thing out of the principles we've talked about was that she was accountable. And you might also argue, by the way, if you went way back to a few videos ago, she was very client-centered and was thinking about the health and welfare of the person she was supporting. Our third case asked about Alex bringing the training materials created by Agency A to Business B. And yes, Alex is violating the principle of privacy. He's doing that in actually two ways. The first is he's violating confidentiality. He doesn't own that information. It belongs to somebody else. Sometimes we call that intellectual property. And he's not allowed to share it without their input. And that's another principle, ownership. Ownership is the third type of privacy. Sometimes we own things, sometimes we own information, sometimes we own ideas, and sometimes we own spaces. But privacy is really all about people violating what we own, whether it's our information, our body, our body's personal space, or things that we possess. Alex violated two of those. However, all he would have needed to do is talk to the person in charge of Agency A and get their permission, and all of a sudden, he would have been behaving in an entirely ethical way. How did you do? We're going to go into Lesson 6, taking a look at privacy in more detail, because it's so central to the work we do and is closely related to the concept of dignity from earlier in the course.